So um, let me close this. Uh, wait a second. Okay. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna talk about this project. Um, this is actually from my uh, master student Yu Zhang's thesis work. Um, so I'm right now assistant professor at the, at the Department of Computer Science and also School of Computing at Queen's University in Canada. So in this project, we use the network science and the genetic programming um, to identify potential genes that are associated with autism. So what is autism? Um, autism spectrum disorder is a um, developmental disorder. It's often characterized by impaired social interaction and communication, repetitive behaviors, restricted interests, and strong, um, it showed, it, it has been shown to have strong genetic basis, which means, um, so you can inherit autism risk genes from parents, so it runs in the family. Um, so what we wanted to do is, can we identify genetic markers that can, um, that show strong associations with the autism spectrum disorder? So there are actually um, many studies on the genetics of autism. Um, over the years, hundreds of genes have been identified to be associated with autism. However, most of them um, have very limited association, has a very weak effect. So now the knowledge, now we understand that autism is driven by a multitude of genomic variants across the genome. So it's not influenced by individual genes um, and it's more likely to be the outcome of a large number of genes that interact with each other. So those genomic variants, they can, from, um, they can come from different molecular pathways and they interact in a really complex fashion. So the research challenge here is how can we identify those large number of genes that are associated with autism? So in our project, we use the network science and the genetic programming. The reason that we use the network science is because um, instead of looking at one gene at a time or a collection of individual genetic effects, we um, hypothesize that human genetics is complex and those genes, they interact in a in a complex fashion. So if we can look at how those genes interact with each other, uh, maybe we can find um, potential genes that are associated with autism um, using the knowledge of known autism genes. So that's why the first step of this project is to construct a human molecular interaction network. So this network serves as a map. It describes the pattern of interactions among um, the entire uh, genome in human. So once we have this network, we um, collected the two sets of genes. One is the positive set. So this set uh, includes all the well-known autism genes. So they serve as positive training cases. We also collected a negative training set. So this set contains genes that are well known um, that they have no association with any neurological uh, diseases or disorders. So they are the negative training samples. And then we designed a genetic programming algorithm to um, to uh, make predictions or classifications using the positive and negative gene sets. And then once we have trained GP models and then we can make a prediction, we can rank all the genes in the network based on the likelihood that um, like how much they, um, they are associated with autism. So in the end, we'll have this prioritized gene list. Okay, 
So, because our training data is organized as a network, so what would be the features that we can consider for classification? Um, there are actually many network-based gene prioritization studies, but in most of those studies, um, they use this proximity assumption, which means that um, oftentimes we assume if we want to find new potential genes that are associated with autism, we look at known autism genes and we find genes are closely related to those known autism genes. So that's the proximity assumption. However, over the years, when we have identified more and more autism genes, we notice that those genes, they actually spread um, across the entire interactive network. So they're not necessarily connected or in close neighborhoods of those known autism genes. So this indicates that the proximity assumption might not work the best or might not be the most effective strategy. So instead, in our project, we um, propose to consider node properties as features. Um, and our hypothesis is that maybe we could look at um, nodes or genes in network that show similar structure or properties as autism genes. So if we can identify those structurally similar genes, maybe we can test them and see if they really have a high association with the disease, with the disorder. So we have considered um, a number of network properties. So here we have included six network centrality measures, degree, betweenness, closeness, eigenvector centrality, personalized the page rank centrality and the K-core. So these are the measurements that can assess how important um, structurally one node is in the context of the network. We also considered um, 69 orbits of graphlet. So graphlet is basically a motif, a network motif. So it's a unique network pattern. And then when we look at, so here we have the example of all four node graphlets. So when we look at those graphlets, we can see there are unique positions on each graph. So those positions, they are called orbits. So we considered all possible four node and five node graphlets and there are 69 unique, unique orbits. So, um, so we treat those um, as 69 new features and we count how many times one node is located on um, those unique orbits, their frequency. So once we have the features and we used a linear GP algorithm, so here we have our prediction results. Um, as we can see, we had the we had the best prediction model with the mean classification error as 0 0.3. We had the best precision and recall as one. We had the best area under the curve as 0 0.783. Um, so the numbers may not look really impressive in the context of machine learning. However, um, considering the complex of this disease, so these um, accuracies, this performance is actually quite, um, quite good. We also um, took advantage of the feature importance ability of linear GP because we can um, count how many times uh, one feature um, is the effective feature in the best, in the final best predictive model. So we can count the occurrence frequencies of each feature and then we know which features are more important. So on the left, we have, um, we actually collected 1000 runs. So we just counted how frequently one feature occurred in the 1000 best evolved models. Um, and the right hand side, we have the ranking. So these are the top 10 features, the most important features. We see we have betweenness, coreness, closeness, and degree centralities. We also have a number of orbits. So here we have the smaller graphs, they show those orbits. So next, we did a comparison because we want to know. Um, uh, whether or not the feature selection by linear GP is really effective. So we conducted a second round of analysis using only the features that have higher 
um, occurrence frequency than the average. So uh, we compare two rounds of analysis. The first one is to use the full feature set. And the second one is only to use the selected, the most frequent features. So we compare the average precision at K um, and also the number of hits. So we can see that using feature selection, the prediction accuracy has uh, significantly improved. So which indicates um, the feature selection ability of linear GP is really uh, effective for this application problem. So um, it's not shown here, but our prediction results were also successfully validated using an independent sequencing data set. Um, so to wrap up in this project, we showed that GP can serve as a really promising learning tool for this complex bioinformatic problem, the gene disease association studies or prioritization of um, disease gene study. Um, so in the future, we would like to compare our linear GP performance with other machine learning algorithms. Um, namely uh, random forest support vector machines and maybe deep learning. Um, once we have developed a framework, so we also would like to use our methodology to predict uh, association genes for other complex diseases or disorders. All right, so that's the, the whole story. Thank you very much. I hope everybody stay safe and uh, take care. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ping. We are uh, ready for questions. Uh, we already have two uh, questions. One is from Bill. He says, uh, which kind of linear GP uh, did you use? Which kind of linear GP? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that I understand this question clearly. Is the parameters or? Uh, well, the question is not more uh, uh, detailed than this, but there is another question from, from Douglas Diaz, which is probably uh, related. Uh, meanwhile, uh, um, uh, Billy is specifying the question. Uh, the, the, from that, the one from Douglas is, um, uh, did you use any commercial application or even an open source library for running linear GP? So in practice, the question is about the implementation, the specific uh, software or implementation that you use for uh, linear GP. Yeah, so uh, for this study, we did not use any um, applications or packages or libraries. So we did, uh, we, code, we coded from scratch for our own linear GP algorithm. Okay, thank you. I think this answer is answering both questions. Are there any other questions? I have one question, meanwhile. Um, since you are essentially using, let's say, low-level features uh, extracted from the graph of uh, association, gene association, can, um, can, let's say, the predictors built using linear GP be useful for um, uh, interpretation of higher level features of autism by specialists? Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, so that's the, we, we actually had this idea for a while because um, biological systems, they are hierarchical. So it would be really good to have um, a model, a prediction model that's more interpretable. So we could be looking at a hierarchical solution or model where we have the genes and then we group them into pathways or functional groups. So that's something we had in mind for a while, but um, it's just not really clear at this point, like how to do that. Okay, uh, thank you. I think so. Yeah, especially be, with uh, linear GP, because I think for tree GP is more natural to see that hierarchical structure. But for linear GP, um, I don't know that answer yet. Maybe we can convert a linear genetic program to a graph or to a binary tree. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. 
Thank you. Meanwhile, um, so uh, Bill is making a question slash suggestion. So are you going to make your code for Linear GP available, publicly available? Um, yes, that's, a, that's the plan. Yes, we will. So we actually have published partially some code um, from this project on GitHub, um, but might not be the Linear GP part of this. I don't know, I'll check, but it's definitely going to be published um, in the future, in the near future. Okay, thank you. So, if there are no other questions, I leave uh, the stage and the words to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that'll conclude for um, our GP number two session. So we actually had a quite full house. We had almost 40 people. Um, thank you very much, everyone. So we'll see you in our next session.